and we are live oh wrong scene there we go all right welcome back to another live q a um we're gonna be diving into how to become a developer when you're broke i think it's gonna be a fun topic interesting photo but get it cheap um to get the i don't even know what that specific model is but not necessarily serpy i'll dive into why but yeah so i got through most of my coding boot camp with a chromebook and i want to talk about that a bit more and there are a lot of a lot of good cheap resources out there that i think if paired if you pair personal projects if you pair reinforcing what you're learning through a lot of free resources those free or cheap resources become exponentially more impactful in your journey to becoming a developer so i have a lot of stuff i want to talk about hey john glad you could catch a stream hey um one second i think there's an echo i'm gonna fix that one second Now you see me. What's up, John? Hope all is well. Glad to see you. I appreciate that, John. Thank you so much. Um, Cool. Let's dive into it. I think this is going to be helpful to a lot of people. Um, I guess we'll kind of stick with the synth way for a little bit. It's a new playlist. We'll see how it works. It's kind of chill. It's like a in-between of... I don't know. Not lo-fi. It's chill and... Kind of like a little bit more upbeat synth wave that we usually listen to. So I didn't realize it hadn't started. Interested to hear you. Yeah, you're good, Serpy. I upped it against Chromebook for compatibility. I got a second hand for 200. Um, I don't know what that converts into US dollars. What is that in US dollars? Now you see me, now you don't. That's right. Hey, Loner Coder, how you doing? All right, let's dive into it. So, um, whew, it's a good topic. So I posted a tweet years ago when I still had Twitter um, saying that you can become a developer that or it's absolutely free to become a developer there's no excuse right um, I don't I don't think it was that like um, I feel I feel like it was a pretty friendly tweet I don't think I said that it was no excuse but I basically was telling people it's like stop paying all this money for all these expensive programs you don't need it like you can become one for free you can get that education for free and that is true technically it's not true because you still kind of need even like some sort of device to you know like read the, the material and practice your coding but i think it's exponentially cheaper than most people realize sometimes it will just take longer but the message was and it was my most popular tweet people loved it and i think sometimes people feel like they have to dump so much money into these programs to become a developer and that's just not the case um it can help speed up the process it can help increase your chances but it's not needed so i really really want to assure people that don't have a lot of money might have gotten laid off during the pandemic like i i get it i promise you there's a, a path forward for you so that's essentially what i want to do today guessing under 300 probably around 260 gotcha so you could definitely get a chromebook for cheaper than that um and i would yeah i'll, I'll dive into that a bit because you would ha you would almost need to test that running the server in the background um and also it kind of becomes like if that's your computer you need to be able to do other things with it as well um you might even arguably if you have even just okay th there's so many different things that you can do we're going to dive into it because i think it's a really interesting topic trying to make like a really cheap components cheap parts into something that's usable you could even okay yeah there's a lot to dive into it so i want to start off with sharing a quick story when i was becoming a software engineer i've shared this already um took me a while to share but like i said i i saved up six weeks worth of income moved back in with my, or six, three months worth of income, moved back in to my mom's, and then eventually um, 
that situation didn't quite work out uh, not because of her, but it just didn't work out. And I was uh, hopping from home to home and kind of just trying to be able to pay my bills. Um, and I remember I I didn't really have, I, I guess like I had a crappy Windows PC and I was able to stream it a long time ago. There were so many bugs, so many issues setting up the server. Um, eventually, when I was uh exhausted uh kind of low income low money i tried to i kind of uh was able to get into a financial situation uh kind of a financial deal to be able to afford a coding boot camp that was really fortunate for me but i remember i could not buy a macbook and i was so frustrated because the coding boot camp all, like all the materials were just like macbook set up and I'm like, man, like, I'm just going to fall behind. Am I not going to be able to do this? And I remember staff expressing concerns. It's like, yeah, we don't really can't really give you setup for even a cheap Windows PC. It's like, um, then I discovered the solution with a Chromebook. I, it was just like coming across different YouTube videos that would show how you could learn web development with just a Chromebook and set up an external server. And I'm, I'm like, OK, you know, I don't have a lot of money to make this work. Um, what is like the cheapest, easiest option to get set up and get rolling? And that became, um, I found uh, external service called Code Anywhere. Kind of, it's like a mix between being able to host your server and you have a code editor within that. And I used that for so long. Um, it's, you know, I, I didn't have to worry about it using, or my computer being able to handle the, uh, the resource usage it's hosted on an external server. And I think I used it for free for a very long time. I think I ended up upgrading it just for convenience, but um, man, I went through most of that coding bootcamp with a Chromebook. I had to kind of figure out, the thing is you can, when you have external servers like that, you can get custom packages that will set up your entire environment without you having to know the command line, without you are being comfortable with it, without you having to like, learn all of these extra details of setting up like a virtual server um you there are services to make that completely easy and when you are learning coding and this is incredibly important i think unless you are absolutely fascinated by it i think way too many people get bogged down by server setup they get uh, bogged down by environment setup and just setting it up perfectly and you just gotta start coding a simple editor load it like just load it up as simple as you can make that whole process simple it's why a lot of coding boot camps won't even dive into like hosting on aws or anything like that they choose heroku because like the majority of your growth as an aspiring developer should come from learning to code not your environment setup so if you can simplify that you can get that set up for as cheap as possible that's really viable, and I think people underestimate that. I went through most of the coding bootcamp with a um, with a Chromebook, and then my tax return. I eventually, at the end of the coding bootcamp, I said, "Screw it!" I used my tax return to get a MacBook Pro. I think I went on a payment plan or something like that. I don't really remember, but um, I could have went through the entire process with a Chromebook. Now, is it the best solution? No, um, and I think Mac can make that environment set up a little bit easier, but I feel like I feel like um, more people should consider getting a Chromebook and being able to set up that external environment, something that makes it really simple. I'm telling you, that is one of the cheapest options I figured out. Even if you have, like there's another, there, there are other creative ways you can do it. Like you can look for a really cheap Windows PC, but um, get a refund policy. Make sure that you can set up your environment, that the server can run properly, like your backend server can run properly and test that out. I think that's incredibly important. And then return it if it can't set it up because I, um, I learned all too well that that can be a huge blocker and a huge frustration. So before you dump all that money into it, make sure you get like some deal where you can return it and get a refund for that. Maybe you have a tablet. That's another option. Maybe you have a tablet lying around. There are, I mean, you could do, do probably do the same thing with a tablet, set it up with something like Code Anywhere, um, have that external setup, and literally you're just visiting a web page at that point. And you can do that with a tablet. You get an external keyboard, you connect it through Bluetooth, or just like even a wire, just connect it. Um, and 
I would, so you can also look at like apps that will set up like a backend server, but it gets really weird. It's sometimes that you'll spend tons of time just trying to get that server set up with the application that you downloaded working. And then there's usually a lot of limitations. So getting, connecting to something like an external service that sets up a VM for you and makes that packaging really convenient is probably the best way to go if you have low income. I, I truly think that. So with that said, I just want to knock it out of the park. You don't need, you don't even need to buy a Windows PC. You don't need a MacBook Pro. I promise, and I'm not sponsored by the way. Like I, I'm not sponsored by Code Anywhere. I just, I used it, it worked. Um, what do you guys think about that option? Because I think a lot of people do worry that they always see like you got to get a MacBook to become a developer, especially if you're like trying to become a JavaScript developer, full stack JavaScript developer. And I just I just don't think it's it's true. And I've seen it literally hold people back from pursuing the profession. So what are your thoughts on that? I needed this video. It's one of the things I constantly worry about. Well, good. Hopefully it's helpful, Georgia. We're going to be diving into I also we're, I'm talking about the device thing. I just want to squash that out. Uh, right away and maybe I, maybe I can create a video showing you how to set up um, your environment with Chromebook on code anywhere or something like that would that be helpful I'm talking fast today uh, I feel like I'm pretty energized for this conversation Don gives us the secrets of web dev thanks Bob welcome back Chromebook prices aren't so good in the UK, I think. My HP Elite processors raw uh, photo files surprisingly well. I've not had much slowdown. I use a more powerful laptop now, though. Gotcha, Serpy. Yeah, I mean, in the United... I'm Usually all my advice comes from, like, in the United States because that's what I know best. But um, it's really just finding a cheap solution and trying to make that work. Um, you could definitely do it with a Windows PC. But, again... Get one with the refund policy, test it out first. But I feel like Chromebooks are cheaper in the United States. Do you recommend starting a YouTube channel to document your learning journey? You can, yeah, especially if you enjoy content, but it's not necessary. It depends on what your medium is. You could even create LinkedIn posts. Uh, Mac or Windows, ignoring price, which side are you on personally? For development, Mac. For everything else, Windows. I should add, I've been stuck on disability benefits quite a long time, so money has always been tight, much more. So now I have two young children, which is, which is why I got into coding. So yeah, it can be a long journey. And Serpy, I would, um, I don't know how long you have for that journey, but I mean, if you're able to afford your bills, great. Um, but if you aren't, again, software engineering journey can be longer. There are other positions that are tech focused, that are even have a little coding involved that you also might consider as a stepping stone to to be able to just bump that income up just a little bit temporarily to help you out that was my next question good glad i'm answering that all right cool so just want to reassure people you don't need a macbook there are cheaper solutions out there what i recommended isn't the only solution as well probably don't try to code on a phone that's probably going to be a pain in the butt for you. Uh, but you potentially can you potentially can screencast your phone to your TV and then get a, a Bluetooth keyboard that connects to your phone and type it out. Um, you could definitely do that. That's an interesting option. It'd be cool just coming up with a list of like all these creative budget friendly options. I like trying to make things work like that. Hey, Luke, how's it going? Jen, Jenna, yeah, welcome. All right, so let's dive into it. So here's what I would do. I wanted to kind of squash that device thing first. Um, secondly, let's talk about my, about my plan. What would I do if I had to become a developer all over again, kind of go in the cheap route? Um, even if I had the money, I probably wouldn't do a coding bootcamp, to be honest. I didn't want to do it. I just, I felt like that was the only choice. I had almost given up on the path because um, I think it took me like a full at least two years to become a developer i was exhausted year and a half i was so exhausted had my first interview i think year and a half in and i just like i bombed it i'm like i'm not meant to be a developer and my finances were tight as it's like it was it was a bad time but um yeah, it took me almost no at least two years to become a developer 
but I went to a coding boot camp because I had almost given up. So let's talk about the self-taught path a bit. What I would start out with, and this is what I started out with a while back, is web design. What is it called? Uh, web design with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and jQuery set by John Duckett. So I started with HTML and CSS, that set. I don't know if the JavaScript and jQuery set were out then, but I have recently looked through that book, um, and I do think he, John Duckett, again, did a pretty good job of giving a nice introduction to that. So I'd start with that book. I would argue I'm better with videos, right? I really enjoyed Treehouse, um, but that book made it so fun to learn that I feel like I was retaining everything. And what I would do is when you're going through that book, um, what I would do is reinforce what you're learning with small little features, right? You learn how to build a navigation, build that navigation. Don't wait until you're like, I know everything to build this entire website. It's like you can build little pieces, little components of that website. Um, so build little features. They don't have to be portfolio projects to reinforce what you're learning. Take it outside the book and practice, practice that code. That's incredibly important. Not enough people to, uh, can do that. And with that book, build a few landing pages, build a few basic front end applications. And so I'm going to be talking about the journey of like a full stack JavaScript engineer. We're not going to just stick to front end, but um, that's where I'd start. That book is amazing. I think it's so amazing. And I would start there. It's cheap. I think like the whole set is like 30 bucks right now. Um, but um, yeah, I would just build a few landing pages. They don't have to be perfect. One of the biggest mistakes that I made was I got stuck on the same damn landing page for weeks, trying to perfect it, trying to make it look good. Don't worry about design. Screw design at this point. Don't worry about design. Even though like the book says like web design, I don't think it's focused on design. I don't even think any of his recent iterations heavily focus on design. So as a front end developer, I think a huge misconception is that you have to be good with design. I've literally talked people out of not quitting because they uh, quitting the front end path or talk people out of quitting. That's probably the way to say it because they thought they had to be really good design or at design to be a good front end developer. That's just not true. I'm terrible with it. I've had three positions. Um, third one was a full stack, but it was more front end focused. All three, I was horrible at design. We had a designer. There are a lot of companies that have designers. You, I think over time, become a little bit more UX savvy, care about the user, how they interact with your page. Um, I think usability and accessibility and just like the UX experience, um, the, well, the user experience, I think you should kind of like, uh, a really good book is called Don't Make Me Think. I think that's what the book is called, and it really simplifies design. I think it's recommended to a lot of designers. I would check it out for sure. Welcome, Brandon. So you can kind of pair that, but I think it's less important. I think that's more of a book you would read afterwards after you're more comfortable with the coding side of things. Um, so with that said, I get started, just build some uh, initial landing pages. Um, landing pages, I think are really good. And what you could even do to practice your CSS skills. This is one thing that I've utilized. I actually want to recommend an old video I created like years ago. I have to create that. Um, I'll probably push that out tomorrow, but I talked about how I would take these free CSS mockups. You can even take paid mockups. Like you're not putting them on your portfolio and just like code out these designs. Essentially what you're doing, you know, 99% of the time as a front end developer, you're taking these designs that you get from a designer, these mockups, and you're coding it out, right? You're building a responsive website. Ideally, you have like a mobile tablet and desktop version. Not always. Sometimes you just have a desktop. Sometimes hopefully you don't just have a mobile and you're building a website. Usually you'll get like desktop and then they'll start to prioritize mobile designs. And then you kind of as a developer can kind of figure out the in between and just show the designer so they can mess with it a bit. Um, but yeah, take these CSS mockups and practice taking these mockups and coding them out. It's essentially what you're going to be doing on the job. Practice that just to reinforce your CSS skills. I think it's a really powerful way to reinforce it. Um, because sometimes people are like, well, I can build something, but I don't want to, I don't know what I want to build. And I think initially this is where like tutorial based projects and creating clones and stuff like that is really helpful in reinforcing your skills until you get to your personal projects.
there's so much to say so i'll pause there what do you guys think about what i said any questions do you disagree um in tunisia chromebook prices are higher than many windows machines thankfully good windows machines can be okay yeah so that's a different uh nice here so you might consider a windows machine over a chromebook yeah the idea with the chromebook is it's usually the cheaper option um but there are going to be countries where that's just not true so i'm glad you brought that up um i love my slightly used thinkpad from ebay what is a thinkpad Variety a notebook. Think bad. Mobile workstations, laptops. Okay. I started applying for C sharp jobs. Good luck, Luke. I've been doing it for a year so far, between three and five hours a night. Bills wise, we don't have a lot <clears throat> uh left over, but working okay, so you you're able to pay the bills. Um, uh, but working would be the same due to lack of what? I have a lot left over, but working would be the same due to lack of of qualification skills well you can build up those skills um I, so like i said i think there's kind of a stigma especially like going into positions like qa developer advocate um even like low code solutions like uh, more of like a salesforce developer or where it's like a little bit more focused on that platform um like email strategy or um seo strategist email like it depends on like what you're really focused on um but it, like if you were fascinated with SEO and that's like your thing as a developer, like you, why not like dive into an SEO strategist? Um, like you could do email marketing. You could just like manage a WordPress website and be more of like a content manager. There's so many other things that you can do that I think you might be qualified for and you're never going to find out unless you apply. Thankfully, the solution you provided where relieves from the devices dilemma oh, well good um what is the name of the book again it's called web design with html css javascript and jquery i would buy that entire set by john duckett and get started i think so i'm a big fan of learning javascript in the dom and just like applying it because you can when you're learning when you're learning how to manipulate the DOM, you're going to get that instant feedback. And I feel like people seem to prefer that. They seem to resonate with getting that feedback as quickly as possible. I also think it's why people feel like it's easier to learn front end developer or yeah, front end development over back end development because they're getting that feedback quickly and they're seeing their progress. It's visual. Whereas they, they probably can grow on the back end. It's just harder to, I think, determine your growth when you are diving into just a logical heavy programming side of being a software engineer that could be a little bit harder to measure but i still think you can grow just as fast but yeah with the front end i really recommend people learn javascript it's okay to learn jquery get exposure to it but ultimately like you want to dive heavily into vanilla javascript and um just it, get things moving on the page like have fun with it build a little gallery you press a button it transitions the image it doesn't have to be like this incredibly uh perfect usable thing that has like the perfect user experience it's like sometimes you just build quirky interactions to play around and have fun with it i think that's a great healthy way that will build up that motivation that'll reinforce that you can have fun learning JavaScript. Because I think some people like dive into something like eloquent JavaScript or like heavy uh, backend JavaScript really quickly. And JavaScript's a frustrating language to learn if it's one of your first programming languages, but it can be a lot of fun. And I think that starts on the front end. Okay. Will I be doing portfolio reviews anytime? I don't have that planned. Um, but if I get enough requests, I can. I, I do have a paid option if you want me to review all of your stuff. But as far as like public portfolio reviews, um, I don't have anything planned yet. Uh, Chris, well, that's probably a great question for Friday. I just want to keep it on topic. I never even finished school, etc. I don't want to go into it all too much as um, it'd be walls of text. Okay. I feel coding is a good way to prove what I am capable of. I enjoy design. Oh, you enjoy design? Nice. Yeah, if you're in a situation where you can sit that out for a couple of years, um, 
If you're in a financial situation like that, that's fine. I'm really speaking more towards people should consider other positions that don't have that time frame. Especially when the bills are piling up. All right. So let's continue pushing forward. So um, with so here's what I would do. Um, once you have built some front end pages, you've done a few CSS mockups, you're a little bit more comfortable with that. You've built some interactivity with JavaScript. I would start now diving into the fundamentals of JavaScript. I would start taking your JavaScript learning a little bit more seriously, um, especially, especially if you're front end focused. Eloquent JavaScript, free book online, really good resource start diving into eloquent javascript the first six chapters you're gonna probably feel like you're getting lost with eloquent javascript so after each chapter build some something simple think about ways where you can apply that concept of what you just learned and you could even apply it on the landing page specifically i think that'd be really healthy but you can um i think just coding out what you're learning throughout the book taking a step back after each i would even argue when i went through eloquent javascript i was coding out uh, i would stop maybe a good at least at least half a dozen times to code something out that i had just learned just a section i picked up because eloquent javascript there's um i think there's a lot they try to cram in those first six chapters and it can get hard very quickly so what you want to do is pause build something out that just reinforced what you had just learned and do that for each concept especially if it like doesn't make complete sense from the beginning i think maybe the first chapter might be a little bit slow going and it's more of an introduction um i'm less worried about that but chapters two through six are pretty hard go to those first uh six chapters build out um yeah get get a little bit more comfortable with that that's that's what i would do this is exactly the route and so once you've completed those six chapters you kind of need to start thinking about whether you want to do back end or, or front end i know a lot of people say i want a full stack position it's like well even if you get a full stack position usually you're going to get a position in what you're a little bit more familiar with what you're more focused on if you're focused on front end you're probably going to get a front end position if you're focused on back end you're probably going to get a back end position or a front end or back end focused position i know it's really confusing but essentially like you need to start figuring out now what do you like about coding which part of that stack in web development so this is assuming you know you're like i actually do want to become a web developer right so that once we can assume that, start figuring out what parts of the code base that you like working with. That means you need to build front end and back end applications. And so if you really love front end and you fully understand those first six chapters of Eloquent JavaScript, you can tackle the challenges. No problem. Now, maybe it's time to dive into React. And I think way too many people dive into React too quickly, but this is a good checkpoint for you if you can understand those first six chapters of eloquent javascript you can handle the challenges no problem in the back of the book now it's time to dive into react if you want to go front end focused or you can dive into node.js i would argue i don't know if the chapter i haven't read the entire chapter i kind of skimmed through it um i think it touches on node.js a bit at the end of the book eloquent javascript does so what i would do what i would personally do hop back onto treehouse or not hop back but i would do treehouse all over again but i would skip a lot of the beginner fundamental content um, and start diving into okay how do i set up a node.js server um, how do i set up express um, and you can so i think a lot of people um, get a little bit confused on what technologies they should learn and in what order i feel like treehouse still does a pretty good job of that the only disagreement I have with Treehouse is I would argue it's probably better to learn a relational database over a non-relational database first, but I would go into Treehouse and I would, now you have to start thinking it's, I'm not going to go from start to finish. I'm going to think, okay, well, here's what I just learned with uh, John Duckett's book. And then I learned all of this in Eloquent JavaScript let's look through treehouse's library and let's skip everything that i need to skip and get to the part that i want to get to it's either going to be like um it's going to be the react portion most likely or it's going to be 
the back end. Now we're diving into Node.js, right? So I'm going the JavaScript route, but there, I mean, I think they have a Python. Um, they probably still have a Python path, but okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. I feel like, at least in the United States, I feel like JavaScript is going to be much more prevalent with the type of positions that I want to go into, especially in the startup culture. So that's why I would pursue full stack JavaScript all over again. Um, you can build a lot of things with it. You can build desktop apps. You can build mobile apps. It can expand, but it also is limited in being able to handle large sets of data as well. So if you are pretty fascinated and you might even like data science might even appeal to you, Python might be a better choice for you. So, but I would dive into this. I would go into Treehouse and I would pick one and go forward with it and then touch on the other one. So when you are diving into web development, I think it's healthy to get exposure to both front end and back end to see what you like. Maybe you get into Node.js and you're like, I don't really like this. I don't enjoy the server side of things. Um, I kind of want to dive further into JavaScript on the front end. So this is a choice you have to make, React or Node.js, and dive into that, figure out what you like. With React specifically, start with the Facebook documentation. I know it's a lot of class-based uh, documentation, but the, it's really flushed out. That documentation is really flushed out, learning class-based components. With Eloquent JavaScript, it should set you up to be able to at least build a class with a prototype chain with JavaScript. I gotta revisit their latest revision, but as long as you understand how classes work in JavaScript, I think that's a really healthy starting point into diving into like Facebook React Docs and then dive into Treehouse where it'll provide more applicable skills. It'll provide like examples and have you build stuff with React. Let's pause there. Questions? What do you guys think so far? Do you think an audiobook about coding is a waste of money if I'm a C-sharp beginner, did one course in Skillshare? Uh, as long as, so whether it's audio or whether you're reading it, um, as long as you're applying it and you're actually coding it out, I think you're going to be fine. Why learn relational over non-relational? Is relational harder? Um, yeah, relational is a little bit harder, but it, it with non-relational, I see a lot of people building bad practices. I think it's really healthy to understand how your data connects. 99% of applications will have relational data. And taking the time out to plan out the structure of your database in that way is very healthy, especially for someone that wants to become a backend developer. But I, I think it's even beneficial. I mean, you don't have to set up a database. You could just use Firestore. Like if you want it, here's another thing. Um, if you start diving into Node.js or um, even just like a Python and Django backend and you realize it's like, I don't really like backend. You can set up, um, and you're like, I really love front end. You can set up an external database. I would just use something like Firestore. And you can actually build a full fledged application, a full stack application with Firestore. You can do pretty much do anything that you want. Um, and it's going to be the same thing as setting up an environment in Node. Like where Node really, or where like having a dedicated back end server comes in handy is like, especially when you start building out. Um, I don't know, microservices, custom execution of code that like I built out like an RSS feed aggregator that makes a request for my website and um, kind of just built it out as a mini microservice. Not really, but I, it was an extra service I had to build out. That would have been much harder to do with kind of just some third party hosted database. You'll have like you have certain you have certain ways that Google might have made it convenient to execute some code, but it's not really built for that, right? So if you have like a lot of custom backend logic, in my opinion, you're usually better off just building the custom backend. Um, but most people don't like have this custom complicated backend logic. And I think they start tacking on all these technologies on the backend. They're like, well, you know, I kind of just want to get some experience with backend. Um, now it's getting really, really complicated. Now they're spending so much time in an area that they don't even enjoy. Um, so I would consider something like Firestore if you don't enjoy backend.
they've started writing out more functional component docs. That's good to see. Okay, that's good to know. But with interviews I've seen, I think it's useful to know both class and functional. Jason, I agree. I just did a LinkedIn post um, about like what people thought was easier to learn, class base or functional. Most people said function. And I think that's true, but I do think you should understand uh, like the changes that happen with that transition to function-based components um, versus that class base. And I think class base kind of makes you like it kind of forces you to understand the life cycle events a little bit more thoroughly. And I think eventually and people just get scared of class based components. It's like I so I flipped my position on like I used to say you need to learn CSS with like learn it from the fundamentals start positioning elements with floats like go back to old school and really figure out like the css fundamentals and then move up to like flexbox and then figure out how flexbox can uh, make everything more convenient what does flexbox uh, replace what does css grid replace like what problems are they solving and slowly move up to that and i've switched my position of like maybe it's okay to start with flexbox right just to get positions up on the page and get it a little bit more flexible and then dive back into the fundamentals i don't think there needs to be this like linear perfect linear path of like going through like heavy 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 fundamentals but not really building too much complexity in any of your projects whereas you know something convenient like flexbox can help you get a page up much more quickly you get that feedback it reinforces you get excited about it you see elements moving on the page and they're right exactly where you want them to be if you did that with the floats they're just like pushed off the screen you don't know what the hell is happening right so i think it's also important to be able to get a product up get it um not a product get a get your project up get that visual feedback as quickly as possible to reinforce that and that can really boost your motivation so with that said i think function based components and learning that route with react can be a very similar experience where you're able to get react applications up a little bit more quickly it's a little less complicated and then you can dive back into just trying to build out a class-based component with different life cycle methods maybe that's the route i think everyone's going to have their preference but it's just kind of a recent switch in thinking that has happened to me recently solid advice on treehouse and eloquent javascript uh good i'm glad it's helpful and I'll reiterate towards the, I feel like sometimes I think through my thoughts, I, like I don't have this, I have a few bullet points. I don't have this giant script. So I think through a lot of this and I want to, at the end, I'll kind of like just go over a quick sequential outline of what I would do because I, I want to really reinforce that. I found a series called An Easy Steps, very good at a starting point. They do a combo book with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It's a good opening if that helps anyone. Okay. I'm about to be a programmer with a Google Pixel book. Aren't those really expensive? I, I wanted one for a long time. The thumbnail got my attention. Okay, awesome. Hopefully you caught the first part of it. Eloquent JavaScript is such a good book. It is. It's a really good book. Um, I learned functional first, but do enjoy life cycle methods and class-based components. It definitely provides more flexibility. I would argue it's kind of confusing going from class-based components to functional. I'm like, but I wanted to do this thing, but it does... It doesn't do this thing in the way I wanted to do. HTML and Bootstrap is also good. Um, I, I would argue no. If you want to strictly go back in, I don't think Bootstrap is. In most cases, Bootstrap is not good. I talked about like getting a page up quickly, but I, I think Bootstrap makes it way too easy. I think Bootstrap is really good for entrepreneurs. I also think it's good for back-end developers that just hate front-end. Um, it's, it's okay to get a little exposure with it, but I would be very careful about how much time you invest in it if you're trying to get a legitimate software engineering position that's focused on web development. Use Linux? I don't know about that. That's, that's going to be a way harder setup. All right, so... Um, but there, I mean, there are people that just love Linux. You could definitely set it up with Linux. I'm just, I think that's going to be a harder setup for most people. Um, okay, so. Once you start going through 
or once I start going through, this is my path, this is what I would do. Once I start diving into the React videos on Treehouse, once I start diving into the Node.js videos, which is on Treehouse, um, I would actually start building out that portfolio, start building out projects that reinforce what you're learning. Now, you're not, you're usually not building entire, like small, tiny little features. It's like now you can start building full fledged projects and bringing that React framework in or like building out your own API. Um, this is where I would start building out your portfolio while you're learning. It doesn't, and you're not going to go from start to finish with your project. And I would argue going like doing a big chunk of learning, then going start to finish might be harder for some people. Maybe it's easier to start building out your portfolio with the concepts that you're learning um, as you're going through the material, right? Maybe you decide to build out the API as you're learning how to use Express with Node.js. Start building out your projects then. And especially if you could build out your own projects, it's probably going to be in a slight, it might be in a slightly different way than the tutorial, but applying it to your actual project is really going to help reinforce what you're learning. And so once you kind of go through this and you get done with Treehouse, right? Maybe you built a few projects and you want to start building more complicated projects. This isn't really the time to do any full fledged courses anymore. Even when we got to Treehouse, I'm saying skip a lot of that content. A lot of people think, oh, I'm just going to go back through it. We're going to go through all the fundamentals. I'm really going to uh, reinforce all these fundamentals if I go through another course and learn them all over again. That's a very ineffective way to reinforce those fundamentals. You need to apply them. You need to apply them. You need to apply those fundamentals. Stop going through courses at this point. The only reason I'm saying go through a course with the React and Node is because it's something new. Don't go back to a course to reinforce fundamentals. Apply those fundamentals. That's really, really important. And a lot of people waste so much time with that and buying another course and another course because they don't understand it. It's like, yeah, you don't understand it because you're not applying it. You have to apply it. Apply it to your personal projects. And if those are too complicated, start with smaller features, smaller components of these larger personal projects. Um, and so once you kind of get done with the material, you feel like you have a good fundamental understanding of React uh, or you have a good fundamental understanding of Node.js. Now, you build out projects. Now you you can watch my videos of like how to come up with project ideas. And like I say, I I would always recommend people if you are completely lost, think back to your old industry. What software could have been built to make your job easier? Build that. That's a really good starting point. And now you're at the part of your learning. This is this is crucial. I, I really want to emphasize this because I see people getting stuck here. This is where people get stuck in tutorial hell. At this point, learning should be supplemental. You should again, I'm going to reemphasize this. You should not be going back into full full courses that go over all the fundamentals again. Your learning should be supplemental. So what do I mean by that? Let's say you build uh, you're building a full stack application. You have um, you know, you have HTML, CSS, a little JavaScript. You decided you really want to focus on backend, so you didn't dive into React, and that's okay. Um, and so you built out your API. You connected it with the database. You're like, this is awesome, right? But, you know, my data is not saving. Why is that, right? And so you look that up, and you figure out, okay, well, usually people will solve that through authentication, where they're going to store that on the backend. Um, and you might look into, like, session. You might look into tokens. But once you finally choose one, now it's like... You, I, I see a lot of people, they'll literally go through an entire course that now advertises authentication because I didn't learn that in my previous course. You don't have to go through an entire course again. It, you're literally just going to be slowing your progress down. Look up articles. Look up a video that goes over authentication. The best thing you can do at this point is get targeted education. And you could even just look up for YouTube videos that will show you how to set up. Um, even just maybe you pick up Passport. And then you're like, okay, well, I got authentication set up with Passport on Node.js. Now I want to actually build out my own authentication, my own custom functions. And so then you look up a video for that, right? Now you're supplementing your education. This is how you avoid getting trapped and going back into tutorial hell. You start limiting that education and you make it very focused and targeted. And then you reinforce it much more quickly. You build that into your application as you're learning it. 
you reinforce it and you learn little education it's supplemental then you reinforce it and then if you have another feature where you're like i don't really know how to do this again small supplemental education and then you build it right away you reinforce it it's okay if you get stuck it's okay like just because you get stuck doesn't necessarily mean you like completely forgot all the fundamentals like if you went through what i told you to go through you're probably going to have those fundamentals down well enough to where now you're going to build and reinforce that knowledge up through actual application of your projects so please don't go back to like full-fledged tutorials at this point like this is how people get trapped in tutorial hell it's it's the worst place to be and it's so discouraging it feels like you're not making progress i'm telling you this is how you prevent yourself from getting trapped be very careful about choosing supplemental education it shouldn't be an entire book it shouldn't be an entire course focus learning that's what you start doing now that's what's going to help you take your projects that are like simple crud projects or even just simple like front end projects up to the next level i'll pause there what do you guys think disagree agree you have any questions this is fun i like coming up with this I kind of wing this kind of stuff, and um, I have fun. I would really enjoy building a course. I just I don't have time to do that right now. Can you say what tech jobs you can start with while you are learning to code again? Um, yeah, and this isn't limited to just these beauty, but um, so we talked about QA, we talked about like an engineer and test, we talked about like an SEO specialist. Um, maybe you even are design savvy and maybe you get into web design that does a little bit of coding on the side. Uh, maybe you have a UX focused position. Um, there are other positions. So maybe it's like an email marketing specialist. Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm. There are a lot of other things that you can do. You can go like low code solutions. You you can become more of like a platform focused developer where it's like not heavy coding and it's um, a lot of uh, kind of pre built custom solutions for that platform, like a Salesforce developer. Um, but that that's not the only list. I would just Google that to kind of see other supplemental jobs. But there are a lot of jobs that I think people should consider um, that you can apply with coding skills. Maybe we should. Um, I think it'd be really fun to do a live stream and just come up with everything that you can do with coding outside of just officially software engineering. I like your point on no perfect linear path. I think it's important to do what gives you the most momentum, passion. If Flexbox builds you that first website, do Flexbox first. Yeah. A lot of people struggle with motivation. I know I struggled with it. Well, I didn't in the beginning. I was so excited for it. I did near the end when I wasn't getting any callbacks. Also, Amazon refurbished laptops are also a good deal. You can get a pretty good laptop for 250 and add the 50 uh, three-year warranty. Um, I, I don't know if the warranty would be worth it, but I would argue just make sure it does have that standard Amazon refund policy. Just so like when you do set up your environment and you do, I would even test it out um, and try to uh, put it under a heavy load, like try to make tons of API requests and uh set it up with your database and just see what you can do to test test out i guess how um test the resources of the pc to see if it's like lagging along because i've been in a situation where like uh i had giant uh well i didn't have a giant sql query but it was a single join and even just combining those two with a single join like the server just slowed to a crawl and I could not figure out what it was. And it was because my, what I was using, but at, it, at the time I, I had set up Chromebooks so I could access, I think it, the local was Linux. That's what it's set up on top of. And then I set up my server with that. And then I could not do any join queries, which is like a pretty common query when you're hitting your database. And so, just make sure that whatever you buy has a refund policy so you can test that out and refund it, send it back, get a refund before you dump all that money into it. Pixel Bay or Pixel Book was fairly cheap, used with 80% battery life. There's a surprising amount of info on 
web deving on Chrome OS. That's pretty cool. I missed the start of this live chat. I'm hoping you save as a recorded live stream. It will be saved. You can definitely check it out. You can't think of a project, clone a website. Um, well, so I mentioned at a certain point, um, you should like you can start with cloning, but you're gonna have to move past that fairly quickly. Cloning, I think, is good in the beginning. I think it's really good in the beginning. You could even use a clone, you could probably revisit it if like all of a sudden you be bring a react into your applications now you don't really want to spend a lot of time thinking about the idea you just want to try to reinforce react cloning can still be good there but they're extremely low value projects um especially for your portfolio so you do eventually want to move off of that is it even worth becoming a dev now with all the automation the future job security for an entry-level devil yeah 100 percent. i did an entire live stream about like will low code replace it um not the short to that is not anytime soon and it depends but no i i wouldn't use kind of like the no code low code solutions to um as in your decision to not become a developer i think it's close to irrelevant if it's actually blocking you from becoming a developer then um yeah it, it shouldn't stop listening to the people that tell you that I've been following tutorials for a year. I always go off on tangents because I like to know why things work. And that's that's healthy curiosity, sir. It can make you take it a bit longer, but my old boss did that as well. Got interest in algorithms and ended up back to learning something else basic. Okay. Struggled with motivation a lot too. When I did uh, Don's 30 day challenge. Yeah, we haven't done one of those in a while. Helped me push through with building stuff. What was your project, Daniel? I forgot. But there's actually a video of um, the 30 day challengers. We went over the projects. Also volunteer to create and maintain an e sports team site. That's awesome. I spoke to Monarch um, after your live stream with him and he gave me one criticism that I really appreciated. He said that I hadn't um, earned the knowledge I was pursuing yet. You hadn't earned the knowledge. What did he mean by that? Um, you hadn't earned that like you were you were going too fast and you were tackling challenges that were too hard. I've been developing a Windows uh, ESL2 for the past year during my boot camp, starting a new job now, and they're providing MacBooks. Was there a discussion earlier about not using a Mac? Yes, it was for becoming a developer. If you had very low income, you do not need to buy a Mac. That's essentially what the message was. We talked about different solutions. And again, I think it'd be fun to come up with creative solutions of how people can get started with coding. Um, I still think my solution is the cheapest and most convenient I found just because again you don't want to have to worry about the setup as a, a beginner it, it's it can be too overwhelming uh best way to prepare for a JavaScript coding interview that's probably a good question to ask on Friday we can go over it then um, remember I do live streams every Wednesday 1 30 every Friday 1 30 central time um, Friday is more open. Wednesday is more of like a focused topic stream. Basically replaces the background for images through voice. Oh, that's right. I thought that was kind of neat. Yeah, just being able to... I think it's huge being able to connect two external APIs. And like, especially if you can build an integration into your application, that's a harder thing to do. Looking at things far beyond... And that's, that's when I say like take it a step up past just a CRUD app. That's what I'm talking about. Daniel. That was a great project. Looking at things far beyond where I was skill-wise at the time that I was... Okay. Gotcha. Makes sense. Sounds like that was good feedback from Monarch. All right. So, cool. Um, Let's keep going. I have more, believe it or not. Let's see. So, one thing to emphasize, your projects, I think, should challenge you to kind of force you to look up documentation again you eventually you want to transition off of like just depending on courses teaching you these concepts like it towards the end it's like there you don't need teaching but like i think you need to get more comfortable looking up documentation understanding the libraries that you're using it's a really healthy skill for a developer to have so looking up documentation and um again just focus on that supplemental learning make it focused don't dive back into all the fundamentals in a giant course that teaches all that. Again, I think that's the wrong way to go. Um, so here's the thing. When do I start applying for jobs, right? So becoming a software engineer is... Um, 
it would be much easier if you could just learn to code, right? But the second portion of that is, and I would say it's almost equally as important to spend time with is um, looking for a job. It's networking. It's getting involved. Maybe, uh, uh, yeah, getting involved in like a hackathon can be really healthy, especially if you have recruiters or companies looking at people's projects at hackathons. Um, and there are a lot of online hackathons. I mentioned Monarchs. I DM'd him. He said he was going to start doing hackathons this year. I don't think he has yet. Hopefully he schedules that soon if he hasn't already. But um, yeah. Once you get that first project up, even before you get your portfolio up, build out that resume, highlight that project. And that's your experience right there, that project. I'm not saying to lie and say, like, try to pretend it's a company and that you were a software engineer at that company. I'm not saying that. That's the wrong way to go about it. I have an entire video about that one. But um, you list it as uh, your, you list it as project experience. Um, I actually have a live stream where I showed my resume and how I listed that in an honest way, in an accurate way. But once you get that first project up, you got to start applying. A lot of people are so afraid that they're like, I'm not ready. I'm going to make a fool of myself. It's like, what do you really have to lose? 99% of the time, companies just aren't going to respond to you. You think they're going to like call you out? Like you're going to be outed for being this poor, like fake developer. And you're just like lying to everyone. You're lying to yourself. It's like, I feel like people actually develop this mindset. And it, I'm not trying to make fun of it. It's it's real. But it's also really silly. You're not going to be outed as not being a developer. It's like, I think more people, once they get that first project up, that first personal project that is their own, they need to apply. They need to get feedback from the job search. You never know what company is going to call you back. And more importantly, like if you get an interview, you can learn what the interview process is like. I think a lot of people, I always say this, they see this interview process as this very scary monster that they, um, they're they afraid to face. It's like the final boss. And it's like, that's probably the way to put it. It's like a lot of people see that first interview as like the final boss. Dude, that's like boss one out of 12. You need to face that first boss and get better. You need to like, maybe, I, I don't know, this is a terrible analogy at this point, but I'm just going to double down on it. Maybe you like get better with the game mechanics and you figure out like how to use that for the next boss that you're going to fight, the next interview that you're going to go to. I really wanted to use a game analogy. I, I think I just butchered it. But you got to go through it. Get that under your belt so you're not so anxious, right? It's okay to be anxious at your first interview, but like, once you realize it's just like two individuals talking in an interview, I think people like put too much emphasis on the power dynamic and they're focused on it and like just have fun with it. Like the other person just wants to work with the developer that is fun to work with. Not necessarily fun, but like enjoyable to work with. Maybe like you're humble. You don't want to go into an interview cocky, but like you learn these things and you learn what kind of questions they're going to ask. And you have to be careful because every interview is going to be different and you shouldn't necessarily be like, oh, this uh, one tested me of Angular. I learned React, so I got to take three months to learn Angular. It's like, okay, that's, that's overboard. Don't do that. But um, you can get a lot of feedback from that first interview. And I think people need to take a step forward and just take a chance on themselves because once you get that first project up usually in most cases you're hire hireable to some company in the world and it's just about continuing to build up those skills continue to make more and more complex projects and you're going to start getting more eyes from more employers right so interview one, like, and I, I wouldn't say like go full force with the interviews. Maybe start off with just like applying to a few jobs a week when you get that first project up and slowly ramp it up as your projects increase in both uh, free, uh, either the number of projects in your portfolio or the complexity in your projects. I'll pause there. And if you guys have any questions related to what we're talking about, feel free to ask in chat. Also, it's been about a year since I started following you, and I want to thank you for everything. Graduated App Academy, 
boot camp and just got an offer. That's exciting. Appreciate the live streams and guidance. Thanks so much for sharing that, Jason. Yo, that's exciting. Congrats, man. That is really cool. Can we show some love for Jason? It always feels so good finally getting that position. The cohort mates that got jobs first were the ones with connections, referrals. I was very technical and had to build up my network and outreach ability for sure. It's a whole other super important skill. It's an entirely different skill to build up, and it's probably one of the more frustrating skills. So if you want to only do front end and you can also do Azure static apps and make easy endpoints via Azure functions or use strap people. I wonder how complicated that is compared to Google Firestore. As long as it's incredibly simple to set that up, sure. But I think front end developers that just want to focus on front end need to have the simplest way to set up a database as possible. I never know how to network. Yeah, I'm not a sociable person. I don't use social networking because it feels too invasive and time consuming. Yeah, it, completely understandable, Serpy. It's something you have to get more comfortable with. It's something it, like I'm very cautious. Uh, you brought up the word like too invasive. It kind of is. I think we share too much on social media and I've definitely been guilty of this. And that's true. And so you could use that mindset to like, just be careful and be very thoughtful about what you share. But again, you know, like they use your data and stuff like that. And you got to look at their privacy policy. So I understand the concern there. Um, but a lot of people feel like a lot of people that did get jobs through networking, a lot of people started out being very introverted. Like they're like, ah, oh, I'm not so sure this isn't for me. And it's a skill you have to build up. I know it might like, make a lot of introverts like fearful it's but you can build that up you can definitely build that up people don't realize this about me but i used to be very very introverted and then i just realized how fun it is to interact with people and connect with people and i, I saw the value in building strong relationships in life and um but i'm very very introverted and i i almost feel like i, I get a lot of like I don't like huge parties. I don't. I feel like my um, my energy's kind of just sucked out of me very quickly. I can, I can bullshit for a while, but I do feel like I enjoy going back. Um, like if I'm, I would like tons of people. I enjoy going back home and resting. Um, I enjoy that going back home and resting after vacation, after spending tons of time. I'm someone that's like just likes a close group of people. You know, hang out with like one, two, three people have some drinks or something and uh that's kind of my perfect night but um yeah i i mean like at heart i'm very introverted and it's a skill you have to build up and when you build up that skill you're going to realize how much further especially career wise i mean not just career wise just even in your personal life how valuable that skill is first time here plus i'm late i work for an agency uh, creating WordPress sites, doing SEO, it's not web dev job per se, finish FCC Scrimba. How would you go about presenting, applying for jobs? Because I think you'd be rightfully so not a dev. That's a great question. Uh, Milos, welcome, by the way, but we'll, let's tackle that question on Friday. I do a live stream every Friday, 1.30 central time. That feels, um, just because it's a little off topic, but we could definitely answer it then. You're welcome, Jason, you earned it. Yeah, seriously, congrats. That's huge. Not a fan of LinkedIn, but had to play the game to get into recruiters DMs. Yep, 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 yep. Do you already have an episode about networking job hunting? Um, we just went over job postings, but no. I don't think I have like an entire episode. And my pen is dead. My pen is dead. There's like 90% ink in that pen and it still doesn't work. I hate. Yo! Ink. Okay. Ink wasn't coming out of this one either. Um, we can do a live stream about that. I don't think we have. I feel like I've talked about it so many times, but it's like broken up in different live streams. I don't think we've had a focus live stream about it. I was very introverted too, nauseous before every interview, but eventually you get used to being nervous and cold messaging people or interviewing isn't as bad. Yeah, it's, it's overcoming that anxiety. That's what it is. It's anxiety. I'm on LinkedIn just for that, but it really does just feel like Facebook rather than network aimed at professional and job hunting. Yeah, I get it. Trust me. I get it. Um, 
sometimes I'll just say things on LinkedIn to like trigger people and get like tons of responses. I think that can be fun. Um, let's see. All right. So engage. So a, a couple things that you can do on LinkedIn, I talk about like sharing your story share your story and see if it resonates or not sharing your story, but like share your projects. If you just learned something really cool, share it. Or if you find something frustrating about the web development industry, as long as it's not like every single post, share it and ask people like, why is this? Why is this in our industry? How can we improve it? Now, if you're just constantly, like I see people constantly complaining about like employers and the job search and software engineering. And it just looks like it makes them look like they're extremely negative people and no one wants to work with people like that. So you need to be thoughtful about your presentation. You do. And you need to be thoughtful about the frequency of the types of posts that you post. Same for Twitter, same for all of your social media accounts. Always expect an employer to look those up. Always, 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 always. Um, with LinkedIn, you can share more positive stuff. You can share your projects. You can talk about the industry a bit. And more importantly, engage with posts on LinkedIn. People get connection requests just by posting a comment that resonated with a lot of others. Like you reply, you can look up hashtags, web development hashtags. You can, if you see people that are connections posting web development stuff, you can engage with their posts, but engage, right? People will add you just for that, especially if they like the way that you think. Recruiters can add you. Hiring managers can add you. And sometimes recruiters and hiring managers, they might not think you're fully qualified just yet, but they'll add you because they usually like your personality, right? And they're, they just want to give you some time to build up those skills. Maybe six months more, they might more seriously consider you for a position that they're thinking about. So a lot of it is even long-term strategy. Hey, Richard, welcome back. I made a few great connections from your coding bootcamp reviews. Yo, that's awesome, Iman. I was surprised at how helpful these people were to me, even though uh, they didn't know me. Oh, you, so you contacted the guests. I highly encourage you to contact guests. So here's the thing about my interviews, my coding bootcamp reviews. A lot of people won't do it. They don't want to go on camera. They don't want to go on a podcast. It's just not for them. And I completely understand that. Um, but the people that do usually, even if they don't think they are, they're usually a little bit more sociable, right? They want to connect with people. They want to help people out. That's why they do it. And if you truly have questions and you want to follow up with any of my guests on the podcast, that's why I include the socials. I include it for a reason. I have them shared at the end and I include it in the description. Connect with the guests that you want to talk to. Don't be super demanding of their time, be respectful of it, but it's okay to ask a couple of questions. Um, and sometimes they'll be more open to even hopping on like a Zoom call. I highly encourage you, more people to reach out to my guests. They can't find my Reddit, okay? That's probably a good thing. Um, probably a good thing for most people. I haven't been on Reddit in a long time. Uh, one of the current top posts on LinkedIn right now is about, uh, Vaseline. Okay. Well, Serpy, curate your... So yeah, LinkedIn will promote uh, popular topics. I have not figured out how to curate that yet because I think like the top news, you see it in the top right, but I'm talking about your activity feed, not your activity feed, but when you click the homepage, all of your connections. Connect with people that promote the content that you want to engage with. You can even stay connected with someone and then unfollow them if they don't promote the content you want to engage with, but curate your feed. That's how you curate your feed and ignore the top news and stuff like that. Usually a top news, I I don't want to ever engage with something like that. Unless I, I want to like copy something. Like I said, sometimes I just like posting a test post and seeing if like it triggers anyone. They're like, oh no, you're wrong for this reason. It's like, I think stuff like that is fun. At least on LinkedIn. I like fucking with people on LinkedIn. Because sometimes, sometimes people on LinkedIn, they just take life too seriously. It's like, it's like so stuffy. It's so... I think they need to like watch stand-up comedy and loosen up a bit. I actually like that LinkedIn is becoming a little less professional in that aspect. I don't like the politics. I usually don't like that being included on LinkedIn. It's, I'm just not a fan of it. But um, yeah, I think LinkedIn, it's, it's a good thing that it's becoming less stuffy. How do you handle mental health when dealing with interviews? If when did it disclose, etc.? 
you mean disclose your mental health? If you feel like the company needs to make accommodations, um, you could talk about that. I would talk about it a little bit later in the interview. Um, but um, it, it depends on the situation, right? I think any, anyone going into a company should feel comfortable and they should feel accepted. And if you feel like that mental health where they need to make accommodations for that, that should be brought up in the interview, 100%. Um, but if it's not accommodations, I don't know. You don't have to share it, right? If it's something very personal to you, sometimes it you only feel more comfortable sharing that kind of stuff, you know, when you've met employees and like you you'll make friends at work and you'll build trust with certain people and you could share it with them so i, I don't want to give like a blanket answer of you absolutely should share it in the interview but if you're going to share it and you need those accommodations i think it's important to bring it up in the interview i've seen your mental health video but it seemed more aimed at overcoming which isn't always an option overcoming gotcha um yeah so you're talking about dealing with it depends that's a really complex issue serpy Hopefully what I said was at least a little bit helpful. All right. Um, okay, last things. Whew. Um, and then I'll sum all this up for everyone really quickly. Sequ sequential order of exactly what I would do. Um, and then spend a little time, like as you're building more complex projects, um, even at the point where you can build like a, a basic CRUD application or basic front end application, with React, maybe now is time to start focusing a little bit on data structures and algorithms, right? Um, I think one of the first hard things to tackle was like, what's a linked list? Learn what a linked list is, try to build that out. Um, it uh, Data structures and algorithms can be a little bit tricky, take it slowly. And I see way too many people focusing on that heavily. I'm telling you, you're gonna grow much faster as a software engineer when you can, um, when you can build out projects. One of the best things that you can do, and it's not always ideal, is branching off into data structures and algorithms because um, because it actually like whatever data structure you're aiming for actually solves a problem in your application. That's one of the best things that you can do because I think having context can really help you understand that data structure and why it's applied, how it works and when it should be applied. Even this idea of like recursion, everyone sees recursion, they get really scared about it. It's like, maybe you don't need to learn recursion right away. I thought a really cool moment to learn recursion was when I would, wanted to recreate a jQuery method and I wanted to traverse the DOM and it had a bunch of nested elements. I, I thought that was a really cool time to use recursion. You don't need recursion either. There are other solutions. Um, that are a little bit less cleaner that might be more efficient recursion isn't always the most efficient solution usually it can be a cleaner solution but um yeah so spend a little time each day picking that up and then most importantly expect this to be at least a two-year journey with the self-taught path Stop with this crap about it's only going to take three months to become a developer. That's not even true for 99.9% .9 of coding bootcamp graduates. Um, with the self-taught path, it can be harder. Give yourself at least two years of a financial backing. Alleviate that financial pressure. One of the biggest blockers I see with a lot of people trying to become a developer, especially with the self-taught path, is they didn't financially plan for it well. Financial pressure changes everything the way you even look at coding. It can change, like you can literally, like if you had no financial pressure, be super excited to wake up and, you know, put an hour in before work, learning how to code. And then, but versus someone that like, is like, oh my God, I have three months left. Now it becomes a chore. Now, like the main motivator and everything that curates your day becomes getting out of this crappy financial situation that I'm is going to bury me eventually, right? So that's why I want to caution people. Sometimes you can always become a developer, but sometimes now isn't the right moment for you as well. Get those, be able to pay the bills, put a little into savings, um, get that financial situation down because I promise you that will change your entire perspective. The way you even tackle this, the way you're able to even just to speed it, well, I mean, yeah, the speed at what, um, how fast it takes to, I'm not talking well, um, it, the efficiency at which you are able to reinforce concepts and apply it to actual implementations, actual projects, just being, 
having that stress, stress alone, which often builds up from a poor financial situation, can help or it can hinder your ability to do that effectively. And instead of taking like maybe a day to understand a concept, maybe it pushes it to like three or four days, maybe a week. Stress is huge. And so that also means taking care of your health. It means eating well, meditating if you'd like. Um, huge stress relief is exercise. It's a huge stress relief. So set those expectations well. Be very realistic about them. And I would argue, so this idea that um, you should become a freelancer as you're becoming a developer. Let's talk about that. And this is the last point I'm going to make, and then I'm going to sum all this up. I think this is a really important point. So before I dive into this, let me just catch up with chat a little bit. I haven't worked over a decade due to mental health, so it's unfortunately something that would inevitably come up. Sure, I understand that, Serpy. Hopefully you can even work that out with a psychologist or a therapist to how to approach that. It was helpful. Thanks. Okay, good. Recommend Algo Expert. I just love the video explanations. All right. Well, we have a recommendation for that. I used um, Simply Code Wars and um, Hacker Rank. There are so many different solutions with it. I think recursion is great if you can, if you cache the results. Okay. All right. Last point. Should you become a freelancer as you're becoming a developer? For most people, no, you shouldn't. Even if you... So if your goal is to become a full-time software engineer, no. If your goal is to become a full-time software engineer and uh, then get into freelancing, no. If your goal is to potentially get into agency work, maybe. So here's the thing about freelancing. You are learning a lot more than just coding with freelancing. You're learning how to run a business, essentially. You're learning how to market. You're learning how to negotiate. You're learning how to you're learning how to track your finances and be able to report it on taxes. And um, you are learning um, just presentation. You're really going to have to care about UX. You're really going to have to care about the, even just the way you pres present yourself. You're going to have to care about networking, um, even just like it takes so much time to build up a portfolio to get real complex projects that are going to help you grow. So the thing with freelancing, and you also have liability, right? What happens when your application fails and all of a sudden a business's landing page goes offline? They can sue you for that. They 100% can sue you for that, and they might win that. And so this idea that everyone should like make money on the side with freelancing, I, there's way more li there's much more liability than people expect with that. And there's a lot more that they have to learn that they in order to get those projects so you can go on freelance job boards and get really really cheap projects and give you some experience but it usually if you don't have a reputation if you don't have a strong portfolio you're usually picking up really basic small projects those projects aren't going to challenge you as a software engineer most of the time you're just trying to solve the customer's problem. You're, you don't get the ability to add all these extra features. Like you, you need to solve the customer's problem. And often the simplest solution is the best. And that's very often not going to challenge you. When we talk about like building more than just CRUD applications or building more than just like a landing page or front end application, it's like, we're talking about complexity. We're talking about integrating APIs. We're talking about building authentication. We're talking about like really understanding thoroughly if you're aiming for full stack of like that entire ecosystem from front end to back end and a lot of freelance projects aren't going to challenge you in that way same thing for open source it's why i don't recommend open source for aspiring developers usually you're learning how to kind of play by the rules and follow the conventions and even just like setting up your, your just like your linting setup and all these extra libraries just to be able to push one line of code into that code base and open up a pr for it and like follow their exact procedures on opening a pr it's like you were learning so much to do so little and so this is where I think freelancing and even just like contributing to open source can really, really hurt you. It's going to slow your growth significantly. Now, if you want to get into agency work, I think it's okay to pick up a couple of projects. The thing I want you to avoid is doing it for the money. You're not going to make a lot of money in the beginning. You have no reputation. You have no portfolio. Don't choose to go the freelancing route 
while you're trying to become a developer because you think it's going to like supplement your income and it's going to make your financial that financial situation should have been solved right like i said it's horrible to try to combat not being able to pay the bills while you are learning software engineering tackle that first get that down first but if you are entrepreneurship minded i think it's completely okay to build a product and put a pricing model around it and just see if you get users behind it because building that product yeah you want to start with an mvp a simplistic version but you don't have to be successful with that product either if you aren't desperate for that money and you've solved that financial situation and again we talked about all those other positions that maybe you should go for um temporarily to solve that if you build out a product and you don't get any, any users you don't necessarily have to just build an mvp a minimal viable product you can continue to add features onto that product you can make it more complex now it's not a smart business strategy because of the time investment but if you are trying to learn how to code and become a full-time software engineer diving into that complexity will only move you forward and who cares if you don't sell any spots or seats or anything like that who cares if you don't get any users you don't even have to put a pricing model around it you could just build an application that's going to get a user base and provide value to people in some way that i think is a much better route because even people that want to become freelancers I think there's so much growth to be had. Like, I think it really helps to work with other software engineers. I think it helps to work in a larger code base. I picked up most of my great conventions by working with other very brilliant engineers in large code bases, right? Um, and it helped me pick up way better habits. I grew way faster as a software engineer where now, you know, like, especially if I didn't want to do content creation, I 100% could have went into freelancing and probably done pretty well with it. I would have figured it out. Um, and I would have had all the tools and knowledge that I needed because I was really challenged at those positions. So those are my thoughts. And I would be careful about people trying to sell you this dream of becoming a freelancer while you're trying to learn how to code. I think it has a lot of caveats that people don't realize. So what do you guys think about that? I will say doing agency work, it's kind of frustrating moving from great projects to terrible ones. I could see that Slayer. Yeah, Slayer has done quite a bit of agency work. And if you like picking up tons of different technologies, that's another benefit of doing agency work. I love working on a product. I love specializing. I love diving deeper into just a single stack as well, which is why I love product work. But typically with full time, you're going to be focused on agency work or product work. Project standards can vary wildly when doing agency work. And yep, I, I've never done agency work. I've just talked to several software engineers that have. Slayer's one. He's been in the community for a long time. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely different. What US cities do you think have the least amount of competition, the easiest cities for breaking into? That's probably a good question for our Friday live stream, Luke. You are, uh, you are spot on on time pressure. That time pressure really, it's just, I, I felt that. I'm telling you, like my entire, I, I, I was so frustrated. I, I'm, I'm not lying about this. I moved from home to home. Just that time pressure just like constantly weighed on me. And I, be, learning coding was just a chore. It was no longer fun. It was stressful. It was depressing. And that time pressure versus a lack of it is such it makes such a huge difference for aspiring developers i'm telling you what when i talk to develop it's just like night and day when i talk to developers that are under like heavy financial pressure versus ones that have played like set those realistic expectations out welcome michael it, it's such it, it's like i said it's night and day with those developers and how they approach learning the code and like how they see the industry it's people that don't have that pressure are usually more positive. They're usually more optimistic and for good reason. Ironically, open source is bad for becoming a developer, but one of the best ways to train actual on the job skill, of familiarizing yourself with code base and getting that PR done. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. I would argue a lot of junior developers that have broke into the industry should seriously consider um, also open source. 
I, but I also think like, yeah, familiarizing yourself with the code base, I think can be, it can be helpful. It's just, is that worth your time? Is that the best time investment? Or maybe participating in a hackathon and building a very complex project is going to move you forward much faster too. It's, it's comparing, yeah, it can give you that exposure, which can be helpful, but is that the, what you should be doing? Yo, Streamlabs OBS UI is broken. Can't click on anyone's name. I think I want to switch back to OBS. Uh, do you think C Sharp Dev could get a Java job? Uh, they are almost the same language, however, the ecosystem. It, de it depends if the company is open to that. We got another one for Friday, probably. I will say that too when it comes to freelancing, in my opinion. Pareto principle applies. I don't know what that is. Based on my agency work, you quickly identify your top clients that you are hoping you can can give you repeat work. I guess Strappy is uh, okay. Um, can you think of an example of project concept that you worked on in your early stages of coding that you would recommend? You shouldn't be copying my projects. Um, again, think of your old industry what you can build so I'll, I'll go over it again we talked about like cloning projects and stuff like that i'll go over that again but um you got to think of your own ultimately you do um think about your old industry what you can build what kind of software you can build that will solve an issue with the old industry i think that's a really good start to coming up with a project idea i think one thing that many not realize is how interdisciplinary software engineering can be especially when you're having to write software within different industries that's true. I think that's a really good point. How hard is it to find a remote job? It's, it's pretty damn hard in, as a junior developer. And again, look up. I've talked about this in live streams. We could even bring it up on Friday. We could dive into that topic. I found a lot of tutorials, etc. will show you a way of doing things and then later show you a much better way of doing it. I love a course that skips that. You love a course that skips that. Okay. Why is that? Like one of our clients is a chain of automotive body shops for which we run their website and booking systems. And there are certain aspects about motor vehicles you need to know. That I mean, that's a really good reason to pair some of your personal projects up with your old industry. You're really going to understand the user behind that. That's going to use your application. Having a user-centered approach is really healthy as a developer. I think most companies will value that pretty highly sounds like open source is more ideal if time isn't of the essence yeah if that's probably a good way to put it asha i like that and so the thing is like if you really want to contribute to your favorite library like go for it i want you to explore what you want to explore but just understand you're take you might be taking a little detour you might be growing from it a little bit is that the most effective way to do it not necessarily but if that's what gets you excited you're like i just want to do this i want to try it out then go for it um, but I also had someone that came to my mentorship meetup where that's all she did. She was contributing to, uh, Mozilla and she invested a lot of time, very little code into the code base. She invested a lot of time and that's all she did. And I kept trying to encourage her to like, really think about what project you want to build. Right. So you just experience a large code base and you're, you're very smart. You're able to pick all this out. Like you are doing, you, I, I guess. I think I told her at one point, I'm like, you're able to pick this stuff out of a large code base way faster than I was when I was trying to become a developer. But it's like the growth really wasn't happening because she didn't apply that in more complicated solutions in her own projects, in her own complex projects. Starbucks forgot to give me blueberries with my steel oats first world problems. Davey, now that is the kind of problem we tackle in these streams. Like forget, forget, I'm not even going to push that to Friday. That is... That is horrible. Davy, can we, can we show some empathy for Davy right now? All right, so let's sum it up. I think this will help because I, I know some people came into this a little bit later and uh, we went through a lot of different things. So, let's sum it up. All right, 
yeah, I think this is a good time to do it. So in the beginning, I want to emphasize you don't need a MacBook. You don't need a MacBook. Again, I will say one more time, you do not need a MacBook. I went through most of my coding bootcamp with a Chromebook. Pair it with an external service, something that makes it easy. The thing you want to do is start off being, um, try to try to be as cost effective as possible, especially with your hardware. And then I just paired that with Code Anywhere for free. I don't know if it's still free. I think they have like some free version, but I was given an editor and it, they set the environment up and I didn't really have to understand command line tools or um, syntax really at all. Setting that up is really convenient. I think being able to use cheap hardware to be able to set that environment up very quickly so you can focus on coding, you can focus on programming concepts. That's where you want to focus most of your time on in the beginning. Um, so don't get a MacBook just to become a developer. Consider a Chromebook. And we talked about like maybe a cheap Windows machine, just make sure it's refundable and that you can send that back if you're not able to set up that full stack environment, a server, um, and challenge that without it like severely lagging. And so again, what I do, if I'm pursuing like full stack JavaScript, um, I would start with a book, uh, web design with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and jQuery by John Duckett, that entire set. Um, definitely start with that series. And what I do, I just build some basic projects, basic landing pages. And at first I wouldn't even focus on the projects. I would build like many little pieces of code on a HTML page to reinforce what I'm learning, especially when it comes to HTML or when it comes to CSS. And then I try to build like some basic interactive components with JavaScript. Um, but also at this point, what you can do, you can take mockups. You can take CSS mockups. I would try a few of these. I take a CSS mockup, translate it into like a, a full landing page. Um, once I'm kind of through that entire series, you can also, uh, build like clone front end parts of websites to reinforce what you're learning. Um, this is a part where you're just trying to reinforce your skills. It's a really, really effective way to learn. CSS and I think experimenting with JavaScript and jQuery getting exposure to jQuery but really experimenting with interacting with the DOM on JavaScript can help reinforce what you're learning because it's very interactive um, it's very interactive it gives you quick feedback on the page because I think sometimes learning JavaScript just you know um, it with an editor and you just have code that's um, well you could you could do this with the Dom but I think like going through something like eloquent JavaScript and just doing nothing but JavaScript can it can make you feel like you're not really growing it's hard to see the progress with that path so I usually don't recommend people start with eloquent JavaScript anymore kind of start with a cheaper resources that goes over the fundamentals and gets you to interact with JavaScript um, and then dive into eloquent JavaScript First six chapters, make sure you understand all those chapters thoroughly. Um, <laughs> rest in peace to Davies Oates. Um, make sure you understand all those chapters thoroughly. Chapters one through six, go through the challenges in the back of the book. When you're going through each chapter, what I would do is I would just, uh, like every time I'd go through a chapter, I would build half a dozen to a dozen pieces, a little uh, code snippets on the side to reinforce what I just learned. Don't just read it. Apply it. Do the challenges. If you don't understand the challenges, go through it again. Read it again. Apply it again. And then once you finish those first six chapters, start thinking about whether you want to dive more into front end or back end. Start considering React. If you go the React route, what I would do is look up Facebook documentation. You know, from what you guys told me, they're starting to push out more function-based component docs, but the class base is just fine as well. If you can go through chapters one through six and eloquent JavaScript, understand the material, you're going to be fine with class-based components. Then I would move on to Treehouse. Skip a lot of the fundamental stuff that you already went over and learn the React portion. You could do another clone with a React, but that eventually you want to start building out your own personal projects. Or if you want to do backend, I don't recommend the Node.js chapter in Eloquent JavaScript. I would recommend, I would honestly just go to Treehouse, skip a lot of the fundamental stuff and just skip directly to the Node stuff. And then build out real projects. 
whether you're going the React portion or the React route or you're going the Node.js route, build out little mini projects. Maybe backend, you're building out a basic API. Um, React, maybe you're even building your portfolio in React. That's okay to do that. Just understand you don't need to... Like if an employer asks you, why did you build your portfolio with React? If it's like a simple static page, it's like, I was just learning. And that's an okay reason to do it. Um, but yeah, you can build, like if you can build out a simple React application uh, without really thinking too hard about the problem that you're trying to solve, initially that can be really helpful. Eventually you want to build your own projects and you, um, you need to think about that implementation. You need to think about the users that are going to use your application take a user-centered approach to learning development. And then you continue building more and more complex projects. That's the route I would go. And then once I got that first project done, that wasn't like a tutorial-based project. Uh, oh, th actually, before I start with that, a really important piece is if you start getting stuck, at this point, like you're going through Treehouse, if you start getting stuck, be careful not to like take entire courses to dive back into the fundamentals. At this point, you should be reading through documentation to reinforce what you just learned or look it up if you forgot, or you should be trying to push forward with your application. Then when you get stuck, look up a tutorial, look up a, uh, like a blog article, look up a YouTube video that's very focused. Now you're at a point where you need to be careful that you don't get trapped with um, tutorial hell and you start using education as supplemental resources that are very targeted with what they're teaching you. Be very careful you don't go back into an entire course again. This is I, so many people go back because they start struggling with those personal projects and immediately they're like, oh no, I'm not ready and then they go back. That's one of the worst mistakes that you can make. Don't develop that habit. It's a horrible habit. Um... Like I said, if you do what I'm telling you to do, you're probably going to have a fairly solid grasp of the fundamentals to continue pushing forward. And then once you get that first project up, that first personal project that's yours, it's not tutorial-based, it's not a clone, it's not a CSS mock-up, anything like that, you get that first project up, you apply for jobs, you get that feedback early, you start connecting with people on LinkedIn. If you have a medium, if you like writing blog posts, if you like creating videos, someone just asked, like, should I start a YouTube channel to document my journey? Yeah, if you really want to do that. You don't have to. There are so many different mediums, but definitely <laughs> LinkedIn, uh, some people hate it, some people love it. You need to take advantage of LinkedIn, but you need to apply for those jobs um, as early as possible. Don't just focus on what I, yeah, don't just focus on applying for tons of jobs. Take time. Research the company a little bit, put that effort into the cover letter, apply directly on the website. Apply to a few per week while you just get that first project up, and then you could slowly ramp that up to applying for more jobs per week as you grow as a software engineer, as your skills get better, as your projects become more complex. And if you want to, you know, get involved with a hackathon that can produce a pretty complex project, give you exposure to... Um, just working with other developers and, you know, at, uh, I forgot to mention Treehouse does have, I think, uh, version control. I think they're pretty good at it too. Yo, Ted, welcome. So you can look into, uh, version control with Treehouse or there are tons of articles around learning Git. Um, but eventually you do want to get that source control down, at least to be able to commit your, uh, code to a code base. Oh, and hackathons can also give you the opportunity to deal with a merge conflict, which is another really useful skill. And then slowly, as you are, if you can build like a basic front end application with React or a basic CRUD application um, with a full stack, I would start spending a little bit more time with data structures and algorithms, just a little bit. People overdo that as well, just a little bit each day. Start doing that daily. And then. Yeah, that's my path. I You just literally keep pushing forward with it. You keep building more and more complex projects and you keep networking and it's just rinse and repeat every single day. And there's no like, I, I think networking, if it, there had to be like one secret to getting a job, it's networking always. But I don't think there's like any major secret that like makes developers stand out. They just continued grinding forward. Maybe even you figure out like you really love to 
a certain aspect of coding. Maybe you really love accessibility. That's really important to you. So that becomes your thing. You talk about it on LinkedIn. That's going to be very attractive to companies that truly care about that. That's it. That's the path. This is rinse and repeat after that. Which is building projects, looking up documentation, or like really targeted education to make your projects more complex. All right, let me catch up with chat. So what do you guys think about that? Was that helpful? Oh, damn, we definitely went over. Okay. That's, I always think I'm like, I can nail this in like an hour and it always takes way longer than that. Okay, a lot of uh, chat. I appreciate everyone showing <laughs> empathy to to Davey and his problems with Starbucks. Our heart goes out to you. Hopefully you can get those blueberries next time. Sister-in-law has organic salad dressing business. I want to build an app for her clients. A lot of, yeah, I know a lot of guys um, will build applications for their wives um, and vice versa. I've heard that more often as well. And this is where it makes sense for only certain companies to develop industry-specific software. I mean, rest in peace, Dave, rest in peace to Davy's Oats. It'll be okay, Davy. Virtual blueberries on the way. I love it. Thank you for showing Davy's support. Windows is your least favorite. I find there are too many de beginners or even new front-end developers diving straight into React without understanding the fundamentals of uh, vanilla JavaScript. Yes, yeah, Slayer. I encountered that a lot. And I encountered that a lot with coding bootcamp graduates too, where they really didn't understand JavaScript very well. It's overwhelming how many resources there are now by comparison, but coming back after so many years, it's much an alien landscape. Amazing how far it's come. Yeah. And JavaScript in general is a very complicated ecosystem. There's a lot to learn. Networking seems to be how many junior developers get work. Do you think focusing on actual sites with real life use cases rather than tutorials for portfolio can make up uh, for less focus on network? Can it make it up? Um, I mean, you should be doing that anyways. And networking. You don't have to network. You can cold apply. Especially if you have more time on your hands where, or you have more runway to be able to continue learning coding. You can just get really, really good at coding. Yes, Laja. Um, and then you'll probably do really well with companies that throw very tough challenges at you. That's a way to get into software engineering. Is it the most effective way? No. But can you? Yes, you can. Order ducats set just now. Thanks. You are welcome, Dean. I have a suggestion for a learning resource, IRC. Okay. It was helpful. Uh, I don't. I don't mean to sound smug about that, but man, that sounds painful, Slayer. Uh, I have a. Uh, it was helpful. You more or less answered my questions as well. Good. Glad to hear it, Elijah. Thanks for the stream done. Missed a lot of it. I'll have to watch the whole video after. Definitely watch it. It's going to be another video that I recommend for people that are going down the self-taught path. Strong overview of this stream. Thanks. I was like, you're good. Hey, thanks for joining me. Thanks for joining me. My name bold. I was unfairly banned on Discord man facepalming medium skin tone. What? Um, email me. Uh, thanks, Don. I'm an introvert, so I feel better knowing... Uh, thank you for the $2, but it's a weird message. Email me. Um, an introvert, so I feel better knowing it doesn't have to be all about 
networking. Glad I could help. Like I said, for introverts, I would... Um, yeah, I, it, it's a skill you should build up slowly. It doesn't have to be right away. You don't have to like... and so It kind of is like a fake it till you make it. You have to force that conversation a little bit. It's going to be very awkward at first. But, you know, even working as a software engineer, I think that's really, really helpful. It, it's just a skill in life that's so helpful. And I, I mentioned, like, I am an introvert. I get my energy sucked out of me, like, going to, like, large parties and stuff like that. That's why I never really did that in college. I did it a couple times. I'm like, this isn't for me. Um, I like kind of a cozy set of friends and just building strong individual relationships. There's an IRC network called Libera, and they have a web development support channel on there called Web Dev. That's really cool. Um, the main channel operator is a great web dev who's been doing it since it was a thing. That's really cool, Slayer. I never would have known that. Emailed you and DM'd. I haven't responded to any of my socials. I haven't had a chance today. Al, chill out a bit. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out that you don't stop learning as soon as you land your first role that's true that is true but this was about definitely landing that first role so that's it that's all i have for you thank you seriously thank you everyone i appreciate you um thanks for just being here these live streams are fun so hopefully this is helpful and i will talk to you on friday we do this every wednesday and friday 1 30 central time um so we'll answer like more generic questions on on friday so a lot of these questions i kind of pushed off definitely bring them up on friday let's dive into it but yeah thanks so much for being here i really appreciate that and again thank you so much for the support any patreons members donations anything like that um Thank you so much for the support. I really appreciate you guys. Always helps. If you um, if you're really stuck, I offer like um, paid mentorship down below. Usually, people just like book a session and then they get unstuck and they move forward. But you don't have to do that. We do these live Q and A's completely free every Wednesday and Friday. So that's it. I'm out of breath. Um, I will see you guys on Friday. Good luck on all of your projects. I hope you guys have a good rest of your week and happy coding, everyone. Take care.